Okay, well, I'll try to keep on time. Oh, that's working. Okay. You can hear me better now, yeah? Um, so I'm going to talk, talk first, of, first of all about what does it mean to see. And then we'll think about what limits vision in nystagmus. And then I think I mentioned in the introduction yesterday that we'd, we'd talk a little bit about can we predict vision later in life. If, if you have a young child with nystagmus and you see their eyes moving and it, it disturbs you, you don't really know what's going to happen, is there a way that we can get some kind of idea what vision is going to be like in life. And then I want to think about these four different aspects of vision. Uh, reading, primarily, we'll spend a bit of time talking about reading. Uh, we'll say uh, something about balance. Um, we'll say something about judging distances. And we'll also say something about seeing faces as well. So what does it mean to see? Well, when you go to the eye clinic and get your vision tested, this is often what happens. You have to work your way down through the vision chart and see how many lines down the vision chart that you can get. And really, that becomes a key measurement in which we categorize visual, visual deficit. Uh, you may get other measurements done like visual fields. This is what's being done in the bottom uh, right here as well. Uh, we also have measurements that we can use for children as well. Now, uh, this is some data that we, we uh, published a few years ago, and it's just on visual acuity measurements in a group of people with albinism and a group of people with infantile nystagmus. Do we have a laser pointer or anything at all? Do you know? And, um, and uh, essentially what you can see is that uh, in people with idiopathic nystagmus, their vision falls into the kind of normal and mild range. And then people with albinism... Uh, will usually have a mild or moderate visual deficit. Um, and really, if we want to express that in a different way, here, here's a vision chart. Uh, people with idiopathic or what might be called congenital nystagmus usually fall in this better range of visual acuities. People with albinism may be higher up the chart there, 
and also uh, I've put on here achromats as well, which are usually higher again. But is that really what we mean by vision? So if you're a person with idiopathic nystagmus and your vision is normal according to the vision chart, is it really normal? Is that what we're saying when we look at visual acuity? Now, uh, we're going to do a bit of anatomy now, a bit of a biology lesson. Uh, this is a picture of an eye. Um, and uh, we've got a camera on there as well, because really when you look at the eye, it's a bit like a camera. Uh, we have a, a hole at the front of our eyes that we can control the size of the pupil, allows the light to come into the eye. Uh, we have a lens system, and then we have a light detective layer at the back, the retina. And uh, in that sense, it is very much like a camera. If you take a digital camera, that's exactly what you have in a digital camera. But one of the key differences with the eye is we have this very important structure called a fovea. Uh, that's shown there in the bottom right-hand side just here. And it's almost like a pit, um, really. We talk about the foveal pit. It really doesn't look that significant when you see a, a, a picture of it or when you look at the size of it as well. But it's really the part of our eye that we look with. Uh, it's where we have a very concentrated... Uh, dense um, packing of our light detectors, the cone cells in our eye, and essentially we move our eyes to, most of the time we move our eyes to get that fovea onto whatever it is that we're interested in. So in that sense, it's not like a camera because we don't really have that situation with a camera. And the point is this, that when we test visual acuity, we're really testing that foveal vision. We're testing how good the fovea is. And we mentioned this yesterday. Uh, really, the issue is that we don't just see with our eyes. We see with our brains. Uh, we mentioned maybe 40 or 50% of the brain is for processing visual information. And actually, when we see what is done with that information, it really tells us what we use vision for as human beings. So the information, here's the eye here. And then the information goes right to the back of your brain here. And then it goes in two directions. We have what is called a where pathway, uh, the, the dorsal stream, and a what pathway, the ventral stream. Uh, there is another aspect of vision that we don't see when we look at a picture of the brain. Um, and that is when we see things. So when we're thinking about what, we're talking about recognizing things. We're talking about recognizing faces, for example, or when we read, of course, we have to recognize individual words in text, or here is a person driving, they need to recognize what is a car or a tree or a person. You know, all of these aspects of, are, are, are important aspects of vision. What, if you like. And then when we think about where, well, we need to know where things are in, in space, in the world, so that we can interact with them. Here's a, an individual kicking a football uh, or picking something up with our hands. We also need to know where we are in the world relative to the rest of the world. So to get through this world, we use vision for that as well. And then, as we've said, we don't uh, just have what and where, but we also have when. We need to know when things are as well, and uh, we think of these activities hitting a, a ball uh, with a bat. Of course, we need to be able to time the location of the ball or even crossing the road. We need to know the speed of objects, and, and, and we need to time things as well. So all of those different aspects of vision contribute to what we call functional vision, the vision that we have that we use every day of our lives. So really the point is working our way down that vision chart only gives us a very, very small aspect of what's important for vision. And we've got a list of things on here, some that we'll think about in a bit more detail, things like sport or driving or reading or perceiving, recognizing faces, eye-hand coordination. All of these things are part of functional vision. So what limits vision in nystagmus? Um, and uh, again, I mentioned that we, we are really doing what we can as researchers to raise the profile of nystagmus. One of the ways that we can do this is try to run special sessions at uh, the big international meetings. Uh, we, we ran a session a couple of years ago on albinism and vision in albinism. 
I think as far as I'm, I, was, I was aware, this is the only specific session that has been run on albinism, and I think nystagmus as well. I don't think there's ever been a specific session run on these, uh, these conditions, and uh, we, need to do what we, mo we, we need to do more as researchers to see whether we can raise the profile of nystagmus uh, this way. Now, we can look at the effect of nystagmus on vision by manipulating nystagmus. So you probably know that uh, you, you have a null region, you have a part of your vision where your eyes are quiet. And what we can do is we can, uh, we can measure uh, how far a person can get down a vision chart like this. We can change their nystagmus by putting their head, in different, the person's head in different locations so that looking either out of their null region or in their null region and actually what we find, and here is a person, this is the, the null region of the person, this is how intense their nystagmus is, and you can see it's quiet here in the mid-range and then higher in the outer range, and we've taken visual acuity measurements at all of these locations. And what we find actually is that even when we're able to modify the nystagmus quite significantly, that we don't get a huge change in vision. Now, I think that's important to remember that if someone came up with a therapy that could stop your nystagmus, it doesn't necessarily mean that your vision will improve. It will improve a little bit, perhaps, but it may not be the key thing. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, a method called optical coherence tomography. We can measure the fovea using opt optical co coherence tomography. Uh, and when we do that, we find that actually a, a lot of what limits vision in nystagmus, certainly in a, a quite a large number of uh, the, the patients that we see, is the development of that fovea. That seems to be far more important in terms of what's limiting vision compared to the nystagmus itself. Now, it's true to say that if you ha had a, something that removed your nystagmus altogether, we don't really know what the long-term effects are, and maybe it would be if, if you had a longer period of time that the vision would improve more than we we can see just by doing a measurement on the day. So we can measure the fovea using a technique called optical coherence tomography. Now I've got a little video uh, clip here uh, to show you. Um, does anyone know if they've had OCT done? Have, can I put your hands up if you've had OCT done? Anyone not know what OCT is? So there's a few here, so that's good. This is this is this this will instruct you. So it may be if you go get your vision tested in the future, you might have this technique done. So here it is, um, and we have an adult device, and essentially you put your chin on a chin rest, and you have a, a, a scanner that scans the back of the eye. Here it is coming in on the eye. You can see it's very quick and easy, a painless. You just take a measurement, you go in close. And that fovea that I just mentioned there, you can see, we can see the fovea on the scan, and we can take our scan, and we can see exactly how well that fovea is developed. Another part of the eye that we're interested in is the optic nerve. There's the optic nerve. It's basically the hole in which all the wiring comes out of the back of the eye and goes to the brain, so we can image that as well. That's a very important part of the eye's image. The problem is, you can imagine it'd be very difficult to do this method on a child. So a lot of our research over the past five or six years has been using this device. It's called handheld OCT. Now, adult OCT has really revolutionized adult ophthalmology and eye disease. It hasn't had that much impact on children's medicine because it's more difficult to measure. There's not a lot of these devices around. And really, one of our goals is to see this method used more widely and to see it used not only for diseases like nystagmus, but for premature children, glaucoma, all of these diseases we want to see OCT used. And what you can see here, here's Artie taking a measurement in our clinic. And what you can see is that if we look at the scan that she does, um, we, again, are able to generate very high quality pictures of the back of the eye, of the fovea. Here's the fovea here. You can see it's a really lovely picture that we've got here. And then we get the same with the optic nerve. We can get a picture through the optic nerve as well. So it really is an amazing uh, method. Now, this is what you see when you do an OCT. This is Helen. 
so here she is peeking out the back while someone's trying to look into a, or the camera's taking a picture of what you see in the device. It's very harmless, very quick, and for us ophthalmologists, well, I'm not an ophthalmologist, I'm a vision scientist, but for the visual community, it really has been an amazing uh, technique. Now, we've done a, quite a lot of work of using OCT to characterize the visual deficits that are at the back of the eye and the front of the eye as well uh, in diseases like albinism or idiopathic nystagmus. And uh, we've also developed a grading system. And uh, what we do is we take a picture of the fovea, and then we see which one of these it looks like the most. This is a normal one, and you can see the pit here and... Uh, these are the light detectors at the back, and you can see as you work your way down, that pit gets less and less, and these kind of, this, this uh, area where it's, it's kind of rounded like this goes flat, and what we, we can do using this is we can predict what someone's vision is going to be like, and this is making the assumption that the fovea is limiting the vision, of course. There is a particular appearance of a disease called achromatopsia. That is a common cause of nystagmus, and it has this kind of gap here at the bottom. And um, here's some OCT images, and just to give an example of how you can take the image, you can just look at the image, and then you can grade it like so. And one of the questions that we had yesterday was, um, can handheld OCT predict vision later in life? Can we predict vision later in life? And what we have done uh, just quite recently, we're just getting the data together at the moment, is we have taken 42 children who we've scanned, well, in this case, about four years ago, because uh, the device has only been around for five years. So as we carry on, we'll get more and more data. Uh, we had Some of them had albinism. Some of them had congenital nystagmus. Some of them had achromatopsia. And then we've waited for four years, and we've seen what their vision is like later on when we've measured them four years later. Now, your vision is still in development. Uh, it's kind of, most of the changes have taken place, but there's still a bit to go. And of course, as these people get older, we'll get an even more accurate measurement of what vision is going to be like later in life. But hopefully you can see, especially if you, if you ignore this one here, this is a, a specific kind of... Um, of uh, foveal hyperplasia, as we call it, achroma, achromatopsia here. But if you look at this trend here of this data, and this is good vision here at the bottom, and then it goes up to poor vision at the top here, and here is our grading of foveal hyperplasia, you can see that we have this trend of changing vision with, with changing, uh, the change in the, the way the fovea looks. So really the idea is, is this, that we think that this is going to be a very important technique. Uh, a child has nystagmus. They come into the clinic. Parents are very upset. They don't really know what it means. And we think that this will give some, you know, if the child has what we think is going to be good vision, it will bring some peace of mind. If, there's, if we think there's going to be poorer vision, then they very early on we can put them in the right direction in terms of getting the support that they need. So we think this is going to be a very important uh, measurement. The other way that you can do it is using this method here, preferential looking, but it is really a very, very coarse measurement uh, compared to um, OCT. So I'm going to move on to speak about reading in nystagmus. Um, now, I'm here as a representative of uh, our group, and I've got some pictures here of some of the other people that have been involved in our research. Rebecca, uh, has done a lot of our work over the years. You'll see her name is mentioned quite a lot with, with this work. Reading and nystagmus. Now, if you think about it, when you read, you've got to recognize words, but you've got to get your eyes on those words. They're on a particular place on a page. So you have what and where going on, and there is quite a lot of timing uh, going on in nice, in. Uh, in reading as well, so we have a, a when as well. As well. Now, this is quite a, a complicated slide that I've got here. I, I presented this to the academics earlier on in the week. I'll try and um, not go into too much detail here, but what kind of things influence reading in nystagmus? Well, quite clearly, the eyes are moving, 
and the eyes will have an influence on nystagmus. We, um, we talk about foveations. They're the slow periods of when the eyes are moving, and we can look at those foveations and, and characterize those. Uh, there is the null region as well, so the ny nystagmus changes with gaze. Uh, there may be other things going on, such as uh, an eye turn, a strabismus. As we've mentioned, that there are abnormalities of the information going into the eye. Uh, there may be some uh, glare because too much light is going into the eye because you have albinism. Uh, there may be some problems with the retina at the back of the eye, and there may be some problems later on in the visual pathway as well. On top of that, there are other factors, uh, and I think this was dealt very well with very well in the last session with some of the things that were were mentioned there, mental well-being, uh, self-esteem, confidence, access to resources are all very important parts of learning to read. So all of these things can impact upon reading. Now we can measure what the eyes are doing very well. And you may have had this done already. We, we have some very, very good eye movement recording methods for adults and also for children as well. And we can see exactly what the eyes are doing, and which means that we can study reading very well. And as we've said, we can also measure what's happening at the back of the eye using uh, OCT. Now, how do we normally read? If you take a normal reader, how do they normally read? Well, I've got a little video clip here showing how a person reads. You can see this dot is the, where the eyes are looking. You can see it jumping from word to word. And you see these quick movements made between words, and then the eye stays on these words. Now, if we look at that as a, as a kind of an eye movement trace, so here you've got uh, the eyes moving from left to right. Uh, to the left is on the bottom. To the right is up to the top. And it looks a bit like a staircase. And each of these flat bits here is when a person is stopping their eyes and looking at a word and then they're looking back at the next sentence and they're looking again from word to word, reading across a line, moving back to the next line. But sometimes there is a rereading process that takes place. If a person has missed a word, they go back and read it again. So the point is this, that we can measure eye movements and we can analyze all of this data to see how people read. How do people with infantile nystagmus read? Well, if we compare that, those la that last trace to people with nystagmus, actually what we find is this, that people with nystagmus use different strategies to read. So some people, it looks like this. Uh, their eyes drift away and they pull their eyes back to look at a word, but you can see this, it's not quite a staircase, but you can see these like flat bits in the nystagmus trace. They're moving from word to word. So a person with nystagmus is, uh, in this case here, that they're, they're, they're moving their eyes from word to word like a normal reader would. Here's a person with pendular nystagmus, and the eye is oscillating from left to right, and yet uh, somehow the, this person with nystagmus is able to make those oscillations move across text, and here you can see them moving their eyes to the next line. And then some individuals, it's just a small number of individuals, they just let their, their eyes move. To, you know, the involuntary part of their eye movements, they just let it m drift across the text and they don't really try to control it at all. They just let it move across the text like so. And if you like, you have different strategies that people use and sometimes people use a combination of strategies and they can do this to read. And I think it's been mentioned a, a number of times that, that there is this facility just to figure out the best way to do things. You know, your eyes and your brain has this amazing plasticity and flexibility to work out how to do things. But it doesn't really answer the question, how well do people with nystagmus read? And uh, what we're going to think about is paragraph reading, word reading, and character reading in infantile nystagmus. So first of all, paragraph reading. So we've used a test like this to look at paragraph reading. In a way, it's a very simple test. It's the, called the Radner reading test. And essentially what it is, is, is like a book. And in the book are short paragraphs of text, and they get smaller in size. And those uh, words uh, that form those paragraphs 
are the same size as the letters on a visual acuity chart. So it's the same as getting your vision done, you work your way down and you work out, read the letters and work your way down the chart. In this case, you're reading paragraphs, but it's the same principle. You've got to work your way until you can't read anymore. We end up with a graph like this. And what you've got along the bottom here is, this is the font size, so you've got big fonts here and then they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And at this point, the person can't read any further down the chart. And then this is the reading speed. This is how fast they take to read the text and we calculate it in words per minute. That's a common method that's used in reading. How many words can you read per minute? So here's a person, they're reading about 200 words per minute. And as the fonts get smaller and smaller and smaller, you can see they maintain that reading speed. And there gets a point where their reading speed starts to drop and drop and drop, and you get to this point here where they can't read any further. So we get a lot of information from doing a very simple measurement like this. Now here are people with uh, nystagmus. We've got a group of people with albinism here, a group of people with idiopathic or congenital nystagmus here, and this is a control group here. And what we've done is we've separated them out so that the people with good vision are at the top here, and then the vision's a bit worse in this row here, a bit worse here, and this group here, it has the worst vision down the bottom. And what you can see is if you look at these graphs, they all have the same shape. They all have this kind of flat bit here. And if you look at the location of, of where these are, this is, this is really saying this, this, these are the controls. They're reading it on average at about 180 words per minute. But if you look at the people with nystagmus, they're doing the same, 180 words per minute. Here's people with albinism, maybe a little bit lower, 170, 180 words per minute. Uh, same here, a bit lower, maybe 160, 170 words per minute. But, so in other words, what you can see here is that if people are given the best fonts available, you know, if they're given the optimal sized fonts, that you can read pretty well. It's only really when we get to the people with the worst vision here, um, that, and, and there's only 12 of them in this, in this group of 71, that, that really that, those reading speeds start to drop. The other thing that you can see on here is this, this kind of tail where the reading speeds drop. It's quite short here, and in people with nystagmus, that tail is much longer. In other words, there's a bigger range of font sizes, if you like, where, where the reading isn't what it should be, where it's not optimal reading. Let me put it in, an, in a graphical form for you. So this is the reading acuity. This is the equivalent to visual acuity, like uh, the equivalent to, uh, it's just like visual acuity. So here are our controls here, and they're, 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 they have good vision, and so their reading acuities are good. And then here's our idiopathic group here, and here's our group with albinism. They have the worst vision. But you'll notice that the maximum reading speeds are really not that different. They're a little bit less, but they're really not so different to the, to the control group that you can see here. And so it's really making the point that in general, people with nystagmus, when they read paragraphs, they read pretty well. You know, they, they really do read pretty well. Another surprise that we found, because we measured the eye movements and we, we quantified how large the nystagmus was, in, in our group. Another thing that we found was that if we look at this, the, 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 the amount of nystagmus people have, nystagmus intensity, and we plot that against how fast people read, we, we really don't get any correlation at all. Now, that really was a surprise. It's, it's, it's really saying that if you've got a very severe nystagmus, intense nystagmus, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a bad reader. So, that's good news, I think, that, you know, uh, I think you, you go to a doctor and, you know, very often doctors know so little about nystagmus and they, they may make the assumption, they see the eyes moving crazy and they say, oh, we can't do anything about this. You're going to be a very poor reader. Well, that's not necessarily the case. You can see that there's no correlation here between how much the eyes move and the reading speed. Another thing that we looked at was... When a person reads down the vision chart, how is their reading related to that vision chart? Now, our data looks like this. It's a bit complicated, but we've got visual acuity down here. And this parameter is when it's the point at which the reading speed starts to get worse. And 
let me just pick off a point. There's a point there, this individual here. What they've got is a visual acuity of, of about 0.4. Uh, that's here on the chart. But they're, the point at which their reading starts to deteriorate is actually 0.8. It's quite a long way up the chart compared to where the visual acuity is. Do you see that? So, so the point is this. You might get down here with your visual acuity, but it doesn't mean that you're going to read well down to this font size here. You might need to move a couple of font sizes up the chart before you've got a font size that you're going to be comfortable with. And I do take the point, and it's been said in some of the previous sessions, that you know you try, you, you, you take a range of font sizes and see what works for you, and you, this is something you can, you can work out for yourself. But I think it's just making the point, really, that when a, a doctor maybe takes the vision down here and says, well, okay, that means you're, you're going to be fine down to here, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is the case. Word reading in infantile nystagmus. Now, we're going to get a little bit more heavy here. Um, this is some of our latest studies. We've said when people read, they move their eyes from word to word like so. And we've got a really good group of uh, reading researchers in Leicester, and they've helped us with a lot of this work. If you pay, take normal readers, they can move their eyes in a very, very precise way to read. And actually what they do is, as they move their eyes from word to word, they can slow their eyes down when they know there's a more complicated word coming. So say you've got a longer word coming, coming say it's a bit more complicated visually, or a word is less common, they're able to slow their eyes down so that they can look at that word for longer. And, and really what they're doing is they're looking kind of not just with the fovea, but they're looking at the, the kind of slightly more peripheral vision and they're making an estimate of what's going to come up next, and they'll slow their eyes down as they do this. Now, here are our uh, eye movement traces again. Here's our step. So this is a target word. Say this is a common or a short word, and this point here, this line, is how long the person is taken to, taking to look at that word. They've stopped their eyes, and they're fixating on that word. And a normal reader when they come across, say, an uncommon or long word, they're able to do this. They're able to make that line longer. They're able to keep their eyes longer on the word or even maybe look at the word twice, you know, while they're looking, they maybe look at the, the second part of the word. And really that what that means is that they don't need to read back, to, 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 to go beyond the word and look back and reread it. It's an efficient mechanism which means that you don't need to read the word a second time. That's the whole point. Um, normal readers have this very good strategy of being able to read words efficiently. And so our question was, if you take people with, so they can do this, uh, two ticks there, and it means they don't need to do this, to reread words. And our question was, if you take people with nystagmus, we know that they kind of move their eyes across text and they, they take these slow periods in their eye movements, we call them foveation periods, and they put them on words, but when they come across you know, more difficult words that are maybe less common or longer words, can they make those foveations longer, just like normal readers? Uh, do they need to make more foveations, uh, or, or do they have to kind of reread the word again? Is, is that really what we're saying, is that because the, the eye movements can't, aren't controlled as well, that they have to reread words again? And the way we did it was, was this. We, we, we had some sentences, and we manipulated the words in the sentence. Here's a, a common word, brother, here, and a less common word, terrier, but the rest of the sentence is the same. Uh, or we, we also um, changed the length of words. Here's a long word here, manuscript, uh, uh, in, in this sentence here, and then uh, a shorter word, lock, in the sentence below it. So we just change an individual word in a sentence, now, we've got some complicated graphs here. And really, if I was to summarize uh, what we see in these graphs, it's really this, that people with nystagmus don't seem to be able to increase the length of time that they spend on a word. But what they can do very efficiently is make a second foveation or a third foveation on a word. They don't need to 
look back and reread it again, they can control their eyes in such a way that they can get their eyes on that word. In other words, it's not as efficient as normal readers, but it's still pretty good. It's still a, a, a pretty effective mechanism at getting hold of those more complicated words. Now, both normal uh, readers and uh, people with nystagmus have a tendency to skip short words. If there are short words, we often just overlook them and we kind of infer what they are. But one of the consequences of that is that normal people don't need to reread those short words, but we find that people with nystagmus, that they do. They have to reread short words. Um, so if you like, here are our uh, normal readers, and they can do these two things, which means they don't need to do this first third thing and reread a word. If we compare our people with nystagmus, they can't do this top one, but they do this second one really well, which means that they don't need to do the third one. They only really do it when they're reading shorter words. So if you like, it's not as good as normal readers, but it's still a pretty good and effective mechanism for getting hold of complicated words. What about character reading in infantile nystagmus? Well, uh, we, we've looked at character reading and we've, we've we changed a few things. We looked at what happens when the words are closely, uh, when the characters are closely spaced together or um, uh, when we change the contrast of characters as well. Here you can see these ones have lower contrast. And what we looked at num was, was at number reading. Now, I guess at the time we were thinking that, you know, mobile phone numbers, all the rest of it. I guess we all store our mobile, mobile phone numbers in our phones anyway. Maybe we don't look at numbers. But our idea was that if you're reading a number, you really need to know what every character is in a number, like a telephone number. Like these are kind of supposed to represent telephone numbers. You have to kind of get hold of every single character. If you get one wrong, you get the number wrong. Now, it might not relate to telephone numbers, but there may be other tasks where you need to get hold of numbers. We also look to see whether arranging numbers vertically helped. You know, if your eyes are moving horizontal and things seem to blur together horizontally and say you've got a phone and you can just, rot you can just twist it around and look at it vertically, does that help? And then we also looked at this, what's called a marquee format, where we put the, the numbers the right way up, but we put them on top of each other. Now, again, we've got some complicated graphs. So let me just cut to the chase and say that really one of the most important things was that if you look at people with nystagmus, they make a lot, lot more mistakes when reading numbers than the normal people here, the, the controls. So this is zero, this line across here, and most of the uh, uh, control readers, they, they're down at zero, whereas uh, people um, with nystagmus, they're pushing that up to 10, 15, 20%, and that, that can be really uh, quite important if you're trying to get hold of those numbers. So character reading seems to be more difficult. Word reading, uh, people with nystagmus seem to do pretty well. Character reading seems to be a particular problem because you have to get hold of those individual characters. We also look to see whether we can assist reading in infantile nystagmus. And the way that we did this was using colored overlays. You might have come across these. They use, sometimes use with dyslexia. You have a whole selection of colors to choose from. You choose your preferred color. You put the, you put the, the overlay on top of the, the text when you read it. Now, what we found was that when we asked people to tell us whether they perceived that the overlays were helping, and we compared uh, some control people here to people with albinism and, and, and people with uh, congenital nystagmus. The people with albinism, 60% of them said that it helped, whereas 50% of people with congenital nystagmus said that it helped. And that was compared to 30% of control. So certainly, people with nystagmus perceive that it helps. Now, when we do our measurements and we've used our reading charts and we've taken our pages and put them over the reading charts and we've done our parameters, and again, I'm going to cut to the chase, we find no significant difference when we look at it and we, we measure whether the reading speeds are better or whether they can read smaller fonts. None of those things seem to change at all. But I think it is important to say that people with nystagmus perceive that these things help because colored overlays are quite cheap. It's, a, it's something you can try. And I think particularly the glare seems to be an issue that people with albinism, they have a lot of glare, and these colored overlays seem to reduce the glare. 
Now, um, my summary for reading is this. So people with nystagmus seem to have this very good range of strategies that they use, this flexible range of strategies. They work it out. As a result of that, they read paragraphs pretty well. We only find that reading sp speeds are about 20% slower in albinism and 15% slower in idiopathic nystagmus. Word reading is pretty good as well. Uh, people with nystagmus are able to adapt their eyes so that they can read well. There are some limitations, which means that they don't read, uh, that their reading of some uncommon words is slower. But character reading is particularly a problem. Getting hold of those individual characters is particularly a problem. Can we assist reading in nystagmus? Well, uh, we're saying that colored filters, they may uh, subjectively help. Now, I've got some, um, what I think are maybe some practical tips for reading in infantile nystagmus. The most obvious one is this, to get the font size that is optimal. If you get the font size that you need, more than likely you're gonna be reading at a normal speed. Make sure the text isn't too crowded, break up long paragraphs if, if it's a document and you have any control over that. Maybe give a bit more time for reading large amounts of text. Um, we've, we've had mentioned uh, in one of the previous talks the importance of having good refraction, good sets of glasses or contact lenses. That's really crucial for reading correctly. Uh, people with nystagmus have a lot of astigmatism, which is a, uh, something that distorts the, the page when you, when you try to read, so you need to have that uh, corrected as well. Uh, try to minimize glare. Um, you can use... Uh, white text on a black background, for example. You could try colored overlays as well. All of these are just very simple, practical tips to improve reading. Now, let me just say about a few things about uh, the other things that we've been looking at. We've also been look looking at balance in nystagmus. And uh, this is Simone Biles uh, doing the amazing things that she does upside down. If you think about it, for, for her to be able to do something like this, she, knows she needs to know exactly where her body is in space. And how do we know where we are in the world? Well, we have vision, of course. We can see. Um, we know where we are, if you can see. But if I close my eyes, I'm able to stand upright. I don't fall over. And that is because there are other senses that contribute to us knowing where we are in the world. We have senses in our muscles and in our limbs. Uh, we have senses on the bottom of our feet that allow us to stand upright. We have senses, motion senses in, in our inner ear as well that all provide information on where we are in the world. Now we've been using uh, this technique here. Uh, let me just see if I can make that video a bit bigger for you. Uh, let me stretch that out a bit. Uh, let me just delete that off there. Um, okay. It should be a bit easier to see now. Right, so this is, this is posturography. And you can see here's a person standing on a platform here. Sorry, we've got a big thing in the way there. Um, and you can see what happens that when they're standing on the platform, the platform sways. We uh, really mess it up for them and try and mess up with their posture. And essentially what we're doing is we're affecting that information that's coming from the muscles and joints in the legs. So really, if you think about it, we can get a person to close their eyes. We can take out their vision. We can have this swaying platform and affect that information that's coming in from the legs. And there's still the information coming in from the ears. And essentially what we can do is see how these different aspects contribute to posture. Now... Again, a lot of information in, these, in this graph. This is with everything contributing, and this is the score for posture, and you can see that people with albinism and pe people with congenital nystagmus balance as well as, as, as the normal uh, people in our group here, as the control people. But when we um, start to introduce that sway reference platform, we start to see changes. Now, the interesting thing is this that if you get people to close their eyes and then you start to introduce that sway platform, people with nystagmus do better than the, the control people. 
And really what it's indicating is that the way that people with nystagmus deal with um, the, the visual deficit is, is they really put more weighting, if you like, on those other senses. They're attaching more significance to those other senses. So I don't know, I do a bit of skiing, snowboarding, and when the light conditions get, that, get worse, you kind of feel your way down the mount mountain. You rely less on vision, and you're just feeling your way down. And it's almost as if people with nystagmus, that's what they're doing. They're putting more uh, on what they can feel through their legs and, and their inner ear as well, and they put less on vision. But in general, uh, posture is pretty good for people with nystagmus. Um, We've also looked at what happens when the world moves relative to us. And what we've done is we've taken a gaming system here uh, with some stereo goggles, and we've, we've moved the world around and measured posture when the world moves around. What we find is that there's a particular type of motion. Uh, it, it's about once every two seconds, a, a kind of a gentle swaying that seems to introduce some instability for people with nystagmus. Now, we don't really know why there is, and we, uh, we want to investigate it a bit more. But, but that's one thing we would say, that there does seem to be, sometimes when there's motion in the visual world, it can has the potential to introduce some postural instability. It's something that we're going to look at in a bit more detail. So in other words, balance in nystagmus is relatively good uh, because the other senses help out, uh, but moving objects might cause some instability. We've also looked at judging distance uh, with nystagmus, and uh, Rebecca and Phil have helped us a lot with this work. If you go to a clinic and get your uh, distance, uh, uh, what we call stereopsis test, is your ability to judge distance, if you like, you do a test like this. This is a Frisbee test, and you have to recognize the circles uh, in, in the, on the plate here, and um, nothing's moving. It's not really a very real-world situation. And actually, most people uh, do very poorly on this test. Uh, I do poorly on this test. I have a, a, a lazy eye and a bit of strabismus. Uh, but I, uh, it really, it, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't really reflect the ability to judge dis distance in the real world. You can do very poorly on this test, and it doesn't make much difference. And what we've really been looking at is, is what happens when you judge distances when you're looking at objects that are moving? This is more like the real world. Here's a car off in the distance. Now, we know how far it is because we see it relative to the road. We know it's, if it's moving away from us, it's getting, it's getting smaller. If it's moving to us, it's getting nearer. And we can see when, uh, how, how quick that, that object is, is, is looming or, or getting smaller. And there are lots of different cues that we use to judge distances that are really not being picked up in the clinic, and we've devised this test. And essentially what it is is a, a, a kind of a moving object, and the person judges, this, judges the distance by using their hands to, to move a, a guide below. And the, the, stim, st the stimuli are very simple. It might be an object like this that just gets smaller, or there may be something that helps to judge uh, the size of the object, some other information that helps to make that judgment. and. Um, Essentially what we find, and we haven't published this data yet, but essentially what we find is there are certain situations, such as when an object is particularly small, where people with nystagmus take a lot longer to realize that that object is changing with distance. So there seems to be, it's not so much that they make a, a, a that they're inaccurate at judging distance, but it takes longer to make a judgment of when something is moving and when something is changing its distance. There's a time delay, if you like. Um, Rebecca has been running a project on looking at uh, facial recognition in nystagmus. I think this is something that has come up in the sessions as well. Seems to be an important issue. Uh, we've really been looking at um, the ability to recognize emotions in faces. Um, and that's because there's a very good uh, test of faces that have been developed to do this. Um, to do uh, facial recognition, you either have to use famous people or take pictures that are, of people that are known to the person. So this is an easier thing to do. And you can see that each of these fa faces represents uh, an emotion. And our task is like this. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to do this or not. 
Some of you might be able to. So there's face, there's the face that you're looking for. And then I'm going to show you two faces, and you need to tell me if it's the first or second face, right? Now, first of all, what kind of emotion would you say that is? Has anyone got any ideas of what they think that is in terms of an emotion? Happy, yeah. So it is. It's a happy face. So uh, we would switch that off, and then here's the first face. Here's the second face. And you can tell me which one you think it is. Is it the first or the second? It's the second, right. So that's quite easy. But what we do is we manipulate how long you see that face for. So the key issue with nystagmus is you, you have a condition that affects the timing and, and gives you these small periods of time when you have clear vision. So we're changing the amount of information that's available with time, and then we look at those thresholds of time. Now, you're all thinking that was an easy task, so let me give you something that's a bit more difficult. And would, I realize that some of you are quite far from the screen and the faces might be too small. So here's our face. And I want you to tell me whether the face is present or absent. So was it present or absent? Present. So most of you got that. But the idea is that, you, of course, you have to search around and find the face. And that is a different task altogether. And I know a number of people have mentioned you go into a crowded room and trying to recognize faces in a crowded room. You're searching around. People are moving around. And that's a lot more difficult as well. And of course, what we're doing as well is changing the timing. We're looking at the, the time it takes for people to get onto that right face and say, yes, I can see it, or no, I can't see it. So uh, my overall conclusions are this, is that people with nystagmus can use vision for tasks such as reading and balance and judging distances reasonably well, actually. A lot of these aspects that we've looked at uh, people with nystagmus actually do pretty well. But it's really when the task becomes more challenging and when time becomes a factor that people with nystagmus find visual tasks more difficult. A complex visual scene, uh, a busy room, um, the whole concept of time to see, you know, that the time it takes for you to see something and make a decision based on what you can see maybe crossing the road or if you drive, making decisions based on uh, two cars coming in opposite directions. You have to make a decision on whether you can get out from that junction. You know, all of these things become a lot more difficult with nystagmus. It's all to do with something that we call signal to noise. And uh, essentially, you have less information to work with, less signal, if you like, and more noise. And um, where do we go from here? Well, I think we need to gain a better understanding of other aspects of functional vision. Uh, things like eye-hand coordination and driving and sport are things that have been very little work done on. I think we need to improve the evaluations of functional vision uh, in, in clinical assessments. Really, the type of stuff that you get done in the clinic ha has very little um, relevance when it comes to functional vision. I mean, OK, uh, there are aspects of it that will they're important, but they really don't give an idea of, ha of time to see, for example, uh, or, or of dealing with complex visual scenes. So we need to develop methods to assess that in a, uh, in a clinical uh, setting. And another question that we have is, can we do something to improve functional vision through training? Search tasks in childhood. Maybe we could develop some gaming apps or something like that that can be used with children to improve uh, functional vision as well. Now, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I've got questions there. I've only left two minutes, I'm afraid, but uh, I'm willing to answer any questions if you have any. Um, uh, okay, over here. Yeah, so, so what, what we do is, th there's a method that Rich Hersel developed called gaze-dependent visual acuity. And uh, it, it's basically a method where you, we put a, a light on the head, we have our vision chart, and we have seven different positions. And what we can do is measure the null region, like the visual acuity, the null region in terms of visual acuity, using that method. Now, we've got lots and lots of data on that that we've done for a drug study. And what it means is that we've got lots of repeated measures data on our people with nystagmus, and we can look at the, the change that nystagmus has on vision. Now, 
It's not just ourselves who've, who's looked at this. The Cardiff group have done some work on this. And what we're finding that's quite surprising is that you can change the vision quite significantly and yet not see a huge difference in vision in visual acuity. That's really what has been quite surprising. And I think it's partly because there are other things that are important, like the retina at the back of the eye, how well that's developed, or maybe other factors, and also the fact that maybe it needs more time. You know, maybe we, if we test uh, and we're doing something in the same session, we're changing the nystagmus. Maybe if your nystagmus re was reduced and you had six months to work with uh, a smaller nystagmus, maybe that would make more of a difference. But, uh, yeah. What would fall on, as you said, are you taking into consideration other underlying conditions? And are you just strictly looking at you know, stuff that you have nystagmus over time? Well, what we've done is we've tried to look at lots of different factors and, and their relationship to visual acuity. So we looked at nystagmus. We've looked at the foveal development for albinism. We've looked at the, what we call iris transillumination, how much light gets through the iris, the, the bit that should block out the light. And we've, we, what we need to do is build up a kind of a model, like a mathematical model of, of how these factors uh, really relate to vision so that we can predict what, vis what, what really is going to limit vision and maybe th those kids that you know, we can take those measurements on and maybe predict bet vision better later in life by combining all of these things. Excuse me. It's a good question. Uh, over here. Yeah. So I mean, when, when you get older, uh, so so particularly what we've, we're trying to predict is visual acuity. I've said visual acuity is not everything, but what we've been trying to do is predict visual acuity. When someone's older, we can take the measurements, so we don't really need to predict it. Maybe what we need to do is understand what is causing the vision to be at that level, whether it's the nystagmus, whether it's the retinal development, whether it's something else, whether it's Glasses, you know, glasses is such a big thing. I know it's been emphasized, you know, how many patients come to us and they really don't have the glasses that they need. To get a, a decent pair of glasses really can make a, or contact lenses makes a, a, a real big difference. But when, when a person is later, uh, is older, we, we can do more in the way of vision assessments. But when you have a very small child, a one-year-old, to get them to sit still and get those measurements, you know, they, they can't verbalize what, what, what they're seeing. So it's just a lot more difficult to get an accurate vision assessment. When, when, a, when you've got a small child. Thank you. Okay. One more. Okay. Um, so how, is, is there, how can I figure out what font is best for my daughter? She's seven. I'm about, I mean, she then seems to tell me. Right. So, you know, the, there are the vision charts, right? No, and not every clinic has them. And um, if it was me, I would say everyone should everyone who's got an establishment should have one of these things done. But, you know, the reality is all, all you really need to do is to, um, to, to get some text and, to, um, and to, to reduce the font size and, and see what their reading is like and just get them to read out loud to you and see when they start to get slower. And that would give you a reasonably good guide, I think, when you, when you get this, this, you know, you can print off in Microsoft Word and start with font size 24 and then, uh, you know, 18 and work it down and then you'll get a good idea that way, actually. In fact, one of the things that I've been um, tr trying to see whether we can develop is to take some of these charts, make them electronic, then they have a printout that they can give to a patient with kind of font sizes on them that, that are good and, and where they start, and then you can take it and put it next to something at school or something, and you can say, well, I know my font that size needs to be up there. We're still not there yet, but I think it would be a very simple thing to do that would, would help people with, that have visual impairments. When you adjust with the colored sheets, you adjust, put them on and see if that's what you like about? Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's usually, that, you, you can spend quite a lot of money getting this done properly, but I, I do think that you can buy the color sheets and try them. You know, I think this is the same advice that's been given a number of points during the day, to, just to try different things. They don't cost a huge amount of money, um, and then I, I think what we find is that the green ones seem to work, certainly with albinism, that's often what they prefer, the green sheets for some reason. Uh, but just try them. I think a lot of it is reducing glare as much as anything. I think that's what makes it uh, uh, more pleasant to read with the, with the sheet over the top. But, um, thank you. All right. Well, small time of appreciation for speaking. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.
break right now. So we'll be back.